Good morning, everybody. Let's talk about the recovery in New York City and let's talk about our priorities. We need to bring this city back 100%. We need to make it better than it was before the pandemic. We need a recovery for all of us. That is the overarching priority, a recovery for all of us. To achieve that, we got to focus on public health, first and foremost, defeating COVID, defeating the Delta variant. We got to focus on public safety, making sure New Yorkers are safe in this city. Public safety equals recovery, but also recovery equals public safety. The more we get back to normal, the safer it will be. So we're going to focus today on those priorities, starting, of course, with COVID. The Delta variant, I think everyone's gotten the memo now, this is dangerous. This is a whole new ball game. The impact across this country is really troubling, the human impact what it's doing to individual Americans, what it's doing to New Yorkers, what it's doing to families, what it is posing as a threat. Is anyone out there that wants to go back to 2020? Does anyone want to go back to restrictions? Does anyone want to go back to seeing a huge loss of life? If you don't want those things, take the Delta variant seriously. And that's why New York City is doing some of the most aggressive actions in America. We are setting the pace on purpose we are taking bold action for ourselves, but also to help everyone else take bold action. The key to NYC pass, this is what's going to be happening all over the country. Make no mistake. What we have put in place related to indoor dining, indoor entertainment, indoor fitness is the shape of things to come. You're going to see more and more companies do the same thing. You're going to see more cities, more counties, more states do the same thing because it's time. And I want to thank President Joe Biden, who embraced this idea immediately, literally within hours. This needs to be done all over this country to stop the Delta variant. We can talk about any and all other issues, but the first thing we should always be talking about is stopping this Delta variant before it does more harm. And the way to do that is vaccination. And the way to get more people vaccinated is not just the voluntary approaches, which I applaud, the incentives, which we believe in and are working, but it requires mandates as well. We've been climbing the ladder. I keep using that phrase to say we're going to use any and all tools. And we see that this approach, a strong, bold approach, works. In fact, we know human nature. A lot of people hearing that there's a requirement or a requirement coming respond to that. It's normal. It's natural. The voluntary phase was great. Went on for seven full months. Lots of incentives, lots of dialogue, lots of communication, lots of opportunity to talk to your doctor or pediatrician. The voluntary phase is over. It's time to mix mandates into this approach everywhere to defeat this enemy. The Delta variant is a different enemy. It must be defeated. So here's what we've seen since we've climbed the ladder and put clear, sharper mandates in place and a very appealing $100 per person incentive. Over the past week, we've seen over 80,000 first doses of the vaccine in New York City. 80,000 New Yorkers came forward to get their first dose. Compare that to 57,000 for the first week in July. 41% increase in such a brief period of time. So clearly, something's working. The message is getting through. We know that health providers in this city have more than doubled the number of doses they have ordered this week. We know that the health community is hearing more and more interest, more and more demand from their patients. The week before, 40,000 doses were ordered. This week, 90,000 doses ordered. This is how we make an impact. This is how we change things. So the key to NYC pass, there's no doubt in my mind it's going to save lives. It's also going to save this city from slipping backwards. We can't let that happen. So everyone, this is going to be our focus every day, continuing to use the right strategies, increase vaccination. And on this issue, I'll come back to the simplest point, vaccination. The whole discussion is vaccination, the whole ball game. If we're going to get it right, we've got to double down on vaccination. That's what we will do every single day in this city. And I think, and I've certainly heard this from uh, business leaders, it's helping other people to do the same thing. When they see the nation's largest city, act, it helps other people to do the same thing, and that benefits all of us. Now, I said a moment ago, the other priority, public safety, of course. Public safety is always a priority for all of us, 
but it's a particularly powerful priority at this moment. We have real work to do. We have real challenges. As you're going to hear from my colleagues, no one is diminishing or belittling the challenges. We got real work to do, real problems to solve. We are coming out of a global pandemic. We hope if we can beat back Delta, we will come out of it soon. We saw a perfect storm of problems, challenges, crises, all hitting together in 2020, like nothing we've ever seen in our lives. But we are fighting back. We are coming back strong. This city, for years and years, was known as the safest big city in America. That is happening again. That is our destiny, period. Any doubting Thomas out there, anyone who says it can't be done, doesn't understand New York City, doesn't understand New Yorkers. We will fight back. We will find the people doing the violence. We will take them off the streets, period. So public safety is necessary. Public safety is especially necessary to the recovery. And again, the recovery itself, which is moving fast, thank God, supports public safety. Our strategy summarized as Safe Summer NYC. And the point was to energize the relationship between police and community, make it strong again, because all police leaders will tell you they need the support of the people and the cooperation involvement of the people. We're seeing that more and more. We're seeing that literally more and more every single week in New York City. We saw it up in the 46th precinct. The 46th precinct on National Night Out, District Attorney Darcel Clark and I were there together. We saw the energy, of people wanting to work with the police, and of course the police wanting to work with the community. So one prong of our approach, a focus on community, a focus on reaching young people, a focus on investing in things that make a difference, like youth recreation programs, a focus on our youth coordination officers working with young people in the community, a focus on the cure violence movement, crisis management system, stopping violence before it happens. Second strand, the focus on everything our police could do, and they're doing it better than ever. More gun arrests this year than we've seen at any time proportionally since 25 years ago. Our officers are out there assertively in a focused way, energetic way, getting guns off the street. They deserve a lot of praise and appreciation. We got problems, but let's also stop to recognize the amazing work that the men and women of the NYPD are doing. The third prong of the approach, Safe Summer NYC, was courts. Getting the courts back in gear. We've seen progress, but we haven't seen enough progress. Court system is doing a better job addressing gun violence and following through on gun cases. We need that and we appreciate that, but we need the court system back 100% full strength. All the rest of society has come back 100% or will come back 100% when its time comes, like our schools. We need the court system to fully recreate where we were before the pandemic because that means consequences for people who do the wrong thing. And when there are consequences, everything works. We need the state and the court system to step up and get to 100% full strength. We have offered for the last year anything and everything they need to do it. And that offer I extend again. But that is the way forward. So the three prongs do work together, can work together, but we need more help from the state. So today we're going to talk about the month of July. And we had real challenges, but we also saw some extraordinary successes by the NYPD and through the cooperation of NYPD and community and through excellent efforts at the grassroots level to stop violence. We saw great prosecutions. You'll hear from the DA in a moment. Things that make a big difference. And remember, the month of July is one of the toughest months every year, the middle of summer. Tough, tough time, and yet the NYPD rose to the challenge. Fought back gun violence. More to do, but real evidence of fighting it back. Those gun arrests speak for themselves and the gang takedowns. The gang takedowns mean taking a lot of bad guys off the streets at the same time, a lot of shooters off the streets at the same time. This is crucial. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about that today and in the days to come. Here are the top line numbers for July 2021. Murder decreased by 49.1%, thank God. 49.1%. Shootings decreased by 35%. The NYPD fought back gun violence with gun arrests, 383 gun arrests in July alone. That is 133% more than last July. In the seven months of this year so far, gun arrests are up 44%, a stunning number. 
We launched the safe summer approach in May. Since then, in that time period since it was launched, murders down 26%, shootings down 10%, shooting victims, thank God, down 11%. More to do, but the NYPD is moving and making an impact, and here to tell you about it, our police commissioner, Dermot Shea. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to start, if I could, uh, just a moment to talk about Detective Second Grade George Moreno. We, we laid George to rest yesterday, so just if New Yorkers could remember and honor George. George was uh, one of the heroes who, on September 11th, raced towards the Twin Towers. Um, tragically, he lost a battle, a two-year battle with cancer last Friday. Um, George is survived by his beautiful wife, kids, including a two-year-old daughter. So just please keep George and his family in your thoughts and prayers. Yesterday was also the 20-year anniversary of the passing of an NYPD legend, crime strategist Jack Maple. And when you think about Jack Maple and, and his contributions to this city, um, I, I held the same seat, and it was an honor to do it for four or five years. I can tell you that when I sat in that chair, the strategies and the tactics change over time. But one thing that does not change and never will is the, the fire burning within the NYPD to make sure that we are doing everything possible for the people of this city, for every victim of a crime in this city, and for every block of this city. So how are we doing? Well, as the mayor said, coming out of the month of July, um, progress. When you look at what we accomplished this July compared to last July, the numbers were just up on the screen. Almost a 50% reduction in homicides, 35% reduction in shootings. What I like to look and step back and look at the crime overall, we know many of the struggles, and the mayor talked about the courts and some of the, the other issues that we've been facing here. Um, but this is now two months in a row, and I take a lot of positive in that. Two months in a row that we're driving the violence down in New York City. When I was here last month, I talked about, look at the cases that have come down in a short order. I think I talked about 90 to 100 really bad people, gang members, that are shooting people in New York City, taken off the streets. Well, we've been building on that. Earlier this week, I sat up in the Bronx with Cy Vance and Darcel Clark, who's here, to talk about a gang takedown in the Bronx. Yesterday, we had an additional gang takedown talk chopping the iron pipeline that's bringing guns up from down south. Some of these gang takedowns you hear about, but there's many more that are occurring. Within the next 30 minutes, there's gonna be a press conference in Queens that details real solid work with our partnership with DA Melinda Katz in Queens, taking violent, the worst of the worst, off the streets. So just yesterday with the Southern District, earlier this week with Manhattan and Bronx DAs, today with Queens, and you're gonna hear more right through next week. These cases are piling up. The work is being put in by our investigators, and it is absolutely going to continue to drive down the violence in New York. We know that we have more work to do, and that's going to continue as well. But the mayor touched on what are we doing with the kids. I was out on National Night Out. I hit every single borough in New York City. Incredible amount of um, discussion with the people in New York City. Incredible amount of collaboration with their cops. I, I think back, and I think back of where we were last June, where we were last July, and where we are now. And I see incredible improvement of, of people coming out and saying, what can we do? We want safe streets. What can we do with you? And that, that wasn't always the case 12 months ago. So I, I think the future is very bright. I think as we continue to take down these cases, um, it's going to make a significant impact. Overall index crime was essentially flat from last July, um, and, and that's really the case when you look at the year-to-day crime as well. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this stat, and I'm going to keep repeating this stat because I think it bears mention. We finished last July, excuse me, last year in New York City with the most gun arrests. You'd have to go back 25 years, 25 years. Already this year, building on that, we are up 44%. So as we start to have those cases move through the criminal justice system, we right now have over 5,100 open cases on individuals that tragically don't listen. They resist all forms of help. They're, in, they're, they're carrying guns in gangs on the streets in New York City. When we start to take those people and see those cases adjudicate, you're going to see the crime and the violence in New York City plummet. 
Mr. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and you said it so well. These are the approaches that work. You're going to be seeing a lot more. But those gun arrests that make me particularly proud of the work you and your colleagues are doing, that is not easy to identify an individual has a gun and get that gun off them and make that arrest. But the NYPD is doing it more than any time in the last quarter century, and it's growing all the time. This is about innovation. This is about energy. This is about focus. Exactly what the commissioner said, as we do remember and honor Jack Maple, someone who never took no for an answer, always believed the NYPD could come up with a new approach, a new strategy, a new way, no matter how tough the circumstance. Today's NYPD is living up to the creed of Jack Maple and making it happen again. And we should be very, very proud of that fact. And everyone, take the time to thank the police officers that you know because they're doing something very powerful right now, turning the tide, making us again the safest big city in America. Now, this requires, of course, close, close cooperation with our prosecutors. You're going to be hearing about gang takedowns regularly. Very powerful takedown in the Bronx this week. It means a lot of shooters are going to be out of commission. A lot of people are going to be safer. And I want to give a lot of credit to the district attorney and her whole team. And there will always be more coming because there's a lot of work they've been doing now over the last year and a half since COVID hit that is all going to come to fruition in the weeks and months ahead. My pleasure to introduce District Attorney of the Bronx, Darcel Clark. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for your leadership on the public health side of the city. Um, that's a real push. That's also making us safe, and it's going to help us in the criminal justice system as well, because it'll help us get the courts back to full staff. It'll help prosecutors' offices get our staff back together so we can do what we have to do to keep the community safe. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Shea, of course, the partnership that we have with the NYPD is uh, unmatched. Um, I cannot do the work that I do each and every day on behalf of the people of the Bronx without the help of the women and men of NYPD. So I thank them for, for their service each and every day. Um, I'm a little biased, too, also married to a member of the service, so, you know special place in my heart as well. But the work that we have to do is serious, and the crime and the violence that we're seeing in the Bronx is real. I listen to community members each and every day, and they're playing their role in this as well, helping us to make sure we identify those key people that are bringing the violence into the community. It's not everybody. We're not doing criminal justice or law enforcement in the same way anymore. It's not nailing and jailing for everyone. Everyone doesn't belong there. But we need the community to help us identify those who are really causing it. And when we look at it, there's those few that are doing it and not all. The community wants to be safe. They're working with the police to make sure we continue to be safe. So my focus then can be on these trigger pullers and these gangs that are bringing real harm to not only each other, but to innocent bystanders. And the case that we took down this week was a, a, a culmination of a lot of things. Um, I give credit to my partner, Cy Vance. Um, it started out as, as a case in Manhattan as a financial crime working with NYPD's Financial Crime uh, Bureau, where these gang members were stealing from, from Lyft and Uber workers during the pandemic. These essential workers that were help keeping this city running, they were being used and abused by these gang members, by these stealing money from them, from social media apps, stealing money from them, taking that money and Using, taking their identity and using it to get unemployment benefits. Again, for people, those most vulnerable during a difficult, the most difficult time in our lives, collecting that unemployment money, getting the unemployment money, and then using it to buy U.S. Um, postal uh, money orders and then spending it. So it was just, just horrible the way they took advantage of vulnerable people. And Cy Vance's team pulling that string and just following the evidence where it lead, led to a number of search warrants, the recovery of a number of weapons, recovery of financial of, of the financial crimes. And in that, they found some evidence of violence that was happening in the Bronx, because these were some Bronx residents doing it, gang members. 
he immediately turned that over to my team and we began working on the violent side of it. And with the help of those search warrants, recovery of those weapons, one of which was connected to a shooting of an innocent bystander, a man who was in a car dealership in the Bronx buying a car with his three small children and rival gang members were plan to meet another rival gang member in that dealership to kill him and they exchanged gunfire and that that father was shot and shielded his children he to this day still has a bullet lodged in him and you know my, our thoughts and prayers continue to go out to him and his family for the trauma they've suffered because they'll never recover from that but we have the people who are responsible for it now so it's all about the accountability of these people that are bringing the violence Another innocent bystander on the street in daylight. Again, rival gang members shooting at each other. She was shot and hit in the hip. And she also has the bullet still lodged in her. Again, will never be the same. Has difficulty walking. We have to hold these individuals accountable. So they're using sophisticated uh, financial schemes to continue to finance their violence, to get more guns and things of that nature. So the message is, we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop until we stop you. And you should know that every resource available in this city is being used to make sure that we identify the right people and we hold them accountable. We have partnerships with our federal law enforcement partners, as well as NYPD, DA's offices working with each other. We're ready willing and able to make sure that we get to those people that are causing this harm. So, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the resources you're providing. Thank you, Commissioner Shea, for your, um, your assistance and your talented investigators that are helping us get this work done. And, and you know, to those families, we are here to help you as well. So, Safe Summer New York City is great, and I, and I fully embrace it because I had Bronx Peace, which is precision enforcement and community engagement. So you've seen the law enforcement side of it by this gang takedown. We have the Saturday Night Lights. We're doing um, um, open streets for the, you know, the kids. Anything we can to engage our young people to give them alternatives to violence is what we're all about. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, District Attorney. And we, we agree, so all of us agree, reaching young people positively giving them options in life, giving them hope, keeping them away from gangs, even if a young person starts to be pulled toward a gang, intervening. This is one of the things the commissioners talked about with the youth coordination officers, intervening. The child's in crisis, help them towards a better path. This is what we're gonna be doing. But make no mistake, we are not gonna to tolerate gangs, we're gonna disrupt them, we're gonna take them down. We're going to send a message to everyone else out there. It's just a matter of time before the NYPD and the prosecutors get to you. So to anyone out there who thinks they can get away with violence in New York City, it's not happening because this NYPD, these prosecutors are coming after you. Again, we need the court system to be just as aggressive, just as focused as the other pieces of the criminal justice puzzle. But together we can do this. We can make very, very clear to anyone, those small number of people who aim to do violence, that they will be caught, they will be prosecuted, they will be going to prison, period. Now, on uh, the other night, Tuesday night, National Night Out, I was up in the 4-6 precinct in the Bronx, as I said, and someone else who was there and got such a powerful response from people who had gathered together because everyone knows she's been a leader on public safety. She was the chair of the Public Safety Committee in the City Council. She has done great work at bringing police and community together in common cause. I want you to hear from council member Vanessa Gibson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. It's good to be with all of you. Thank you to Commissioner Dermot Shea, as well as my sister, Bronx District Attorney Darcel Clark. I am grateful to join all of you today to hear these numbers on what we're seeing across the city in terms of crime reduction, a reduction in murders and a reduction in certainly assaults across the city of New York. When we launched Safe Summer NYC back in April as a preventative measure to combat what we believed would be anticipated violence in the summer, it was with the ability to collaborate with our partners at the NYPD, faith clergy leaders, community partners, and all of our anti-gun violence advocates. 
We wanted to provide meaningful alternatives to crime and violence for our youth, like summer youth employment, like Compass, Sonic, Beacon, Cornerstone programs to really create access and opportunity for all of our young people. Gun buyback programs and initiatives, the successful launch last month of Saturday Night Lights. All of these programs are making a difference. We are giving young people opportunities. We are allowing them to be successful leaders. We are taking guns out of their hands and we are giving them alternatives to violence. That is a good thing. These numbers are promising, but I also know that our work is not done. We must continue to work together with clergy, the anti-gun violence organizations, the New York City crisis management system, our local leaders, and all of our advocates to keep our neighborhoods safe from crime. It is not and cannot be the sole responsibility of the NYPD to keep our neighborhoods safe, but we are the agents of change. We are the solutions that our neighborhoods need. And it is up to all of us to continue to work together to keep our communities safe. The decrease in shootings and murders is truly a sign that Safe Summer NYC is working. And I want to thank you, Commissioner Shea. I want to thank all of our precincts and commanding officers and NCOs and YCOs. And also, Mr. May, I want to thank you. Thank you for joining us in the Bronx in the 46th precinct, along with DA Clark and elected officials, we had an amazing crowd full of energy with young people, with families, and we are working together. National Night Out reminds us that we have to work together and that our work is not done. And so I wanna thank all of you because every New Yorker has an expectation and a fundamental right to be safe and should not worry about being assaulted or shot in our community. We know that this is a state of crisis, but we are doing exactly what we need to do to keep all New Yorkers safe. So again, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Bronx DA Clark, Commissioner Shea, and all the hardworking men and women of the NYPD. Let's continue to do this great work together. Thank you so much, council member. And I agree with you. It's really great when we get people together in common cause and you can feel it up in the Bronx. You can feel the energy. You can feel the fight back. People in the Bronx are not going to accept violence. They're taking back their streets. They're working with NYPD. And that's true in all five boroughs. So I'm very confident that we're turning the tide and we're going to see a lot more in the weeks ahead. And this is crucial to our recovery. So I want to bring it back to recovery. We've been through so much the last year and a half. We have to bring this city back, all of us together. We have to. It's for the, everyone. It's for our kids. It's for our families. It's for people's livelihoods. We've got to bring this city back. That means getting the health care part of the equation right, getting people vaccinated. It means addressing public safety, going after the folks who do the violence, getting them off our streets, bringing back the strength of our communities in every way. That's what we're going to keep doing. And as we recover, you can see it, you can feel it. Go out around any neighborhood of this city. You can see and feel the recovery in action. We've got to celebrate the greatness of New Yorkers. New Yorkers brought this city back showed the entire world what we're made of. And that's why we have an amazing moment in our history coming up in this later this month with Homecoming Week. It is so important both to celebrate what we have all done with each other, but also to show the world the strength of New York City. Because that's going to say to everyone, this is the place to be, this is the place to visit, this is the place to invest, this is the future, New York City. So Homecoming Week is going to be bigger than anyone ever, ever imagined. You look at the lineup just for the concert in Central Park. I am a true music lover. I've never seen a lineup like this in my life. I've asked a lot of people, when have you seen this many extraordinary performers in one place? Folks say consistently, Woodstock's the only comparison they can think of. This is unbelievable, a single day having all this talent in one place. And it's one of five concerts in the five boroughs. And as people are hearing about the other five, excuse me, the other four concerts, there's extraordinary excitement. Well, guess what? We keep building these amazing events into even greater events. So on August 21st, Central Park, a major new addition to the lineup, a global superstar from Colombia, Maluma. Maluma is the top 
concert selling Latin artist in the world. He is a 2018 Latin Grammy Award winner. This is a big deal to so many people in the city to have a star of this caliber join an already star-studded lineup. This is going to make something that is amazing even more amazing, but it's all about bringing us back together. Now remember, there's still chances for free tickets and for the VIP packages for purchase. The next ticket releases are tomorrow, 10 a.m., and Saturday at 9 p.m. So there's still an opportunity to get those tickets. And remember, to participate in any of the five concerts, you got to be vaccinated. Get at least that first dose. So if you want to be a part of this and you're not yet vaccinated, i got a solution for you. Go to one of the hundreds of locations where you can get a free vaccination. Take a few minutes, get that vaccination, get that vaccination card so you can be a part of this amazing moment in our history. Now, Homecoming Week is not just these amazing concerts. The concerts are beautiful, but there's a lot more that's going to go on. From August 14th to August 22nd, 100 plus arts and culture events, 100 plus events in this city, including something very exciting, something New Yorkers love more and more, free movie screenings, outdoors. It is something so special to appreciate the beauty of summer in the city, being out there with people outdoors and also seeing an amazing movie. Uh, we're partnering with Rooftop Films, who have been innovators, who have done amazing work bringing such joy to people. And uh, they're going to be doing something great. They're presenting six award-winning films and TV screenings celebrating New York City. Everything has another element to it of celebrating New York City, showing the greatness of New York City. Free, outdoors, a great way to mark our comeback. And I want to honor and thank Rooftop Films. Uh, they have been a home for great independent films for over 25 years. They've helped promote great works of art that would not have gotten as much attention and appreciation otherwise. They've done amazing work. And I want you to hear from the president of Rooftop Films with my appreciation for everything that you and your colleagues are doing for New York City. My pleasure to introduce Dan Nuxall. Well, thank you very much, Mayor de Blasio. Um, it's a great honor for us to be co-presenting these six outdoor free screenings as part of New York Homecoming Week at this pivotal point in New York's history. Um, Rooftop Films is and always has been a very collaborative organization, um, and we're thrilled to be working with your office and with so many dedicated organizations and individuals all around the city to bring wonderful films and meaningful events to our neighbors uh, all across the five boroughs. At Rooftop Films, our mission is to bring communities together uh, through the medium of film. We started the organization in 1997, screening new independent films on rooftops, and later expanded to large-scale outdoor screenings in different uh, scenic locations, piers, parks, um, and still rooftops um, on occasion as well, um, all across the city. Uh, back in March of last year, we knew that drive-in theaters might be the, one of the only ways that New Yorkers could still come together safely. And we felt that it was our responsibility as an organization to do whatever we could to figure out ways to create a venue and a presentation program uh, to give our fellow New Yorkers hope and joy in, uh, as they emerged from a very dark period. In the end, while most theaters were closed, we were able to present more than uh, 100 free, uh, more than 200 free screenings at our drive-in locations in Brooklyn and Queens, uh, dozens of them uh, free events um, to, uh, to serve nearly 100,000 attendees. But we didn't do it alone. We partnered with many city nonprofits like the New York Hall of Science, the Museum of the Moving Image, NYC EDC, and we turned to the city of New York and especially to City Hall for help in that difficult time. Uh, it wasn't easy, uh, but City Hall was incredibly helpful to us. They provided guidance and support, and they worked as tirelessly as we did to turn empty fields and parking lots into safe, joyous, celebratory cultural gathering places. Starting in June of this year, we shifted back to uh, outdoor non-drive-in screenings around the city, and we're very proud to have kept cinema alive over the past 25 years, and in this last year in particular. Um, we're honored that the city has selected Rooftop to be a part of this historic moment. And as a native New Yorker born and raised in Bayside, Queens, I have experienced the resilience of New York City my entire life firsthand. Um, and it, so it is with great pleasure that I'm here today to announce an exciting lineup of film events that will help to celebrate the revitalization of New York City. The great Alvin Alley had a motto, and that was, dance came from the people and should always be delivered back to the people. We hope to honor that credo when on Monday, August 16th, we will present Jamila Wignott's extraordinary new documentary, Alley, about the visionary New York dancer, director, choreographer, and activist, Alvin Alley in the Bronx, courtesy of Neon. The screening will take place on the northern law of Walter Gladwin Park in the Bronx, and like all the screenings in this series, it will be free and open to the public with RSVP. 
Um, New York is very well represented in film and television, but the borough that is uh, perhaps least documented in film and TV is Staten Island. But in my opinion, the funniest show on television right now is a really amazing show called uh, What We Do in the Shadows, and it is set on that beautiful island to our southwest. On, August, uh, on, on Tuesday, August 17th, on the grounds of the lovely Snug Harbor Culture Center, there will be a special Staten Island screening of the season two finale and an exclusive sneak peek of, of season three premiere of, of FX's critically acclaimed Emmy-nominated uh, comedy series. These last few years, we have witnessed a political awakening unlike any that I've ever experienced in my life, uh, which is why on Wednesday, August 18th, we wanted to present something uh, really special in uh, Jackie Robinson Park in Harlem. Um, we will be presenting uh, the New York premiere of Marcus A. Clark's upcoming documentary, Blood Brothers, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, um, prior to the film's premiere on Netflix. The film captures the complicated and impactful relationship between civil rights leader and, highly, and the legendary boxing superstar, and the event will take place in the park named after a New York athlete who changed the way we think about both, both sports and the fight for equality, Jackie Robinson. We also wanted uh, this week to be a, communal, a week of communal celebration. And on Thursday, August 19th, we will present Amir Questlove Thompson's critically acclaimed Summer of Soul, or When the Revolution Could Not Be Televised, uh, in a location that is actually one of my personal favorite spots in the city, Fort Greene Park. Uh, the film is perhaps the single greatest documentary about the importance of communal gathering in New York City's parks. And we are grateful to Hulu, Disney's Onyx Collective, and Searchlight Pictures for working with us to bring it to the people of Brooklyn. And finally, short films have always been essential to the lifeblood of Rooftop Films programming. And on Friday, August 20th, we will present a collection of several New York short films, including the final episode of season one of HBO's How To with John Wilson, all of which is shot here in New York City. John has spent the last 10 years capturing surprisingly resonant moments of everyday New Yorkers all across the five boroughs. Um, and in the final uh, Queen Set episode that we will be showcasing in this episode, um, uh, it features one of the most beautiful portraits of resilience, kindness, and neighborly love to have emerged from the dark days of the early pandemic. That screening will take place in partnership with our friends at the Museum of the Moving Image on the grounds of the New York Hall of Science in Corona, um, the site of the Queen's Drive-In where we hosted uh, more than 150 uh, screenings throughout 2020 and early 2021. These documentaries, comedies, and short films, and the acclaimed directors who made them all demonstrate that people everywhere, and especially in New York, can rise above a crisis and achieve great things by sticking together and believing in the potential of our fellow neighbors. We're very excited to host these free screenings for all New Yorkers, and we encourage audiences to head to homecoming2021.com to find out about all the films and to RSVP to attend. Thank you again, Mayor de Blasio, for having me here today and for all the work you've done supporting cultural organizations through these times. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dan. And here's my statement. There's a whole lot of culture going on. And this is really going to be amazing. I mean, everything you laid out there, each and every one is going to be exciting and a beautiful communal experience outdoors. But thank you, because uh, you've chosen great works of art, as you have for years and years. And you're helping bring them to everyday people for free. Uh, that's just a beautiful thing. That's the way we do things in New York City. We celebrate arts and culture. It's part of our lifeblood. It's who we are. We also believe it's for everyone. It's supposed to be something for everyone, not just for those of great means. And what you're doing, everyone at Rooftop Films is doing, bringing art to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone, if you want to be a part of these great events, they're free, free, free. Go to nyc.gov slash homecoming week. nyc.gov slash homecoming week for all the details. Okay, now, we'll do our indicators. And uh, as usual, our indicators tell us uh, things we gotta pay attention to, things we gotta watch out for, things we gotta address. Also, some good news. You see the impact of vaccination continuing to hold the line, uh, particularly in terms of hospitalization rate. But we've got more to do on vaccination, to say the least. And a reminder, we're gonna be coming in with new indicators going forward focused again on hospitalization vaccination rate cases we're going to be taking uh, the positivity rate out of the equation in terms of the daily briefings it will still be visible on the department of wealth uh, excuse me department of health and wealth <laughs> website okay here we are with our indicators today number one daily number of people admitted to new york city hospitals for suspected COVID 19 today's report 127 patients confirmed positivity 32.33 percent Hospitalization rate per 100,000, 0.82. Number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. Today's report, 1,365 cases. And number three, percentage of people testing positive citywide for COVID-19. Today's report on a seven-day rolling average, 3.27%. 
Let me talk in, uh, about the uh, crime announcements in Spanish for a moment, and particularly this focus on the gang takedowns, the impact that is making on safety in communities. El número de tiroteos y asesinatos se redujo en julio. Pero nuestro trabajo para mantener a salvo a todos los neoyorquinos todavía no ha terminado. Estos son más que números. Son familias, hermanos, hermanas, madres, padres. Tenemos que protegerlos. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media. And please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. Hi, everyone. We will now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined by Police Commissioner Dermot Shea, Senior Advisor Dr. Jay Varma, President and CEO of Health and Hospitals Dr. Mitch Katz, Executive Director of Citywide Events Dan Gross. Our first question of today goes to James from PIX11. And good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. Thanks for taking my call. James, you know, you're such a dynamic player. We keep moving in lineup. You're lead off today. You can do it all. <laughs> a pleasure to be in that position. Uh, thank you. Uh, if we could, could we start uh, by talking a little more about Governor Cuomo's situation, about which you've spoken quite a bit in the last few days. But I'm hoping that you can provide more information about the effect that the ongoing issues surrounding the governor are having on important issues here for the city, like battling COVID, uh, getting rent relief money out, uh, advocating for federal resources. What effect is that situation having on issues like those for us? James, it's hurting the people in New York State and New York City. There's no question. Uh, you know, a guy who spends 11 hours having to testify about his sexual harassment and assaults is not a guy who's focusing on fighting COVID uh, or getting us federal aid or getting rent relief money to people who need it. The rent relief situation is a very telling example. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh, look at these other states. They don't do things the same way we do. But 48 other states managed to get their rent relief money out. So for anyone who you know, is saying, oh, look how great New York State is, New York State dropped the ball on rent relief. And one of the reasons must have been a distracted governor. We got hundreds of thousands of people who need that money. The federal government sent it to us. It's still not in the hands of New Yorkers. It's crazy. Here's another example. On uh, homelessness, uh, we came to an agreement with the state legislature to raise the value of the homeless vouchers so more and more people who are homeless could get an apartment. City Council passed legislation as well. Everybody was aligned. All it needs is a signature from the governor to help people who are homeless get an apartment. Governor hasn't managed to sign that bill weeks and weeks after it got passed. So, you know, that, again, that was, that was the middle of June when that bill got passed. It's now uh, the beginning of August, no action whatsoever. So it's time for him to leave let the lieutenant governor take over and let her get to work solving these problems with us because people are hurting right now and they need leaders who can focus and not be in the middle of defending themselves against endless charges against them. Go ahead, James. And thank you. Also, you've mentioned uh, actually uh, today and yesterday how other cities, other jurisdictions, maybe even other states want to emulate the key to NYC pass. Can you give us more details? Are there specific cities that have approached you or the administration or specific states uh, that are interested in implementing a similar plan? Out of respect for each jurisdiction and how they have to do things, I'm not gonna name locations, they'll speak for themselves, but there's definitely been a lot of interest from public and private sector. Remember, James, I announced the key to NYC pass uh, and about five hours later, the President of the United States endorsed it. Uh, and, and I want to thank President Joe Biden. That was very important and very helpful. Uh, folks in the private sector are embracing this kind of approach more and more. You're going to see a lot more. You are unquestionably going to see a lot more. But what we've heard from a lot of people, including in the restaurant community, was we know that we need to keep everyone safe, including our employees. We need government to tell us this is the right thing to do so we have a clear standard we can point to. 
And I think you're going to see a lot of people embrace it. You're going to see some opposition, too. That's America. That's okay. But overwhelmingly, this is the shape of things to come. And more and more people in public and private sector are going to use this approach to make sure folks are vaccinated. The next question goes to Matt from Newsday. Hey, good morning, all. How are you? Matt, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right. Thank you for asking. Um, since the speaking of the vaccine mandate that James was just discussing, um, since it does not exclude previously infected people, what evidence do you have that the vaccine is necessary to supplant, to seem to supplement natural immunity, particularly since your team doesn't know or won't say, despite being asked about this repeatedly since March, how many reinfection cases there have been among the unvaccinated in New York City? So, Matt, I want to make sure I understood you. We'll, we'll speak to the information about the reinfection, but, but tell me that first part of what you're saying again. The question is, what evidence is there that the vaccine is needed to supplement natural immunity? Oh, wow. Okay. Buckle your seatbelts, Matt. I'm going to unleash Dr. Jay Varma and Dr. Mitch Katz. Um, clearly, the only reason we're talking about recovery, the only reason that so many jobs are back, the only reason that people are able to live their lives is the vaccinations. That's the whole ballgame. Um, natural immunity, they can talk to you about the value of natural immunity. It does not replace vaccination, not even close. And have there been some reinfections? Yes, and I would welcome Dr. Varma, Dr. Katz, if you have any uh, new facts or figures, please offer it. But we know it's rare. CDC documented that in the advisory last week. And we also know that when people are reinfected, the if results are much less than they would have been if someone wasn't vaccinated. So I think that the evidence is overwhelming, but, but let them have it, Dr. Varma. Great. No, thank you very much for the question. I, I first want to just focus on a terminology issue that may you know, sound odd, but it's really important. Uh, I really don't like when people talk about this term natural immunity. There's nothing natural about being infected with a virus. It's certainly no more natural than, than getting vaccinations. So what we want to differentiate is virus-induced immunity. So you got infected with the virus versus vaccine-induced immunity, which means that you developed immunity because you've been vaccinated. So what we know is, is, is imperfect, as it is throughout this epidemic. But there have been a number of studies looking at the immune responses uh, in people who had infection with the virus uh, compared with those who got vaccinated, and also looking at people who got both vaccinated on top of having a prior uh, viral infection. And what we see consistently is that people who have been vaccinated or people who have been vaccinated on top of a prior infection have both more immune response, so a, a larger number of antibodies and other correlative immunity, as well as broader protection against other strains. So we know that vaccines are safe, we know that they're effective, and we also know that they provide added benefit uh, to people who have been previously infected with the virus. So uh, I'll turn to Dr. Katz, but again to both of you. Matt is putting forward the notion that somehow there's information uh, that isn't being uh, handled transparently. I, I think we've been very transparent, but I want all the transparency in the world. The number of reinfections, if we have a particular number, we know it's rare, but we should still uh, issue that information. So starting again, just Dr. Varma, do you have a specific set of facts on that to share or else we'll follow up with Matt later? Yeah, I think we'll need to follow up with Matt. I don't have the latest numbers. The health department does track this very carefully and they track uh, infections in people who have been previously uh, infected with the virus, as well as, of course, infections, what we call breakthrough infections in people who have been previously vaccinated. So yes, we can um, have the health department team follow up with that. Yeah, and that's information we will share. Go ahead, Dr. Katz. Well, Dr. Varma did a great job on the science. I wanna talk about the clinical work, because many of my own patients have asked me this question. They've said, uh, you know, Dr. Katz, I have antibodies. Um, do I really need vaccination? And I say, yes, yes, you really need vaccination. Why? Because as Dr. Varma says, the combination of vaccination uh, plus having been infected will give you greater immunity, will protect you even more. And perhaps most important, uh, in New York City, most of the people who have been infected were infected last February or March. They were infected with the virus that was circulating at that time. 
As Dr. Varma has said, the vaccine induces a broader set of immune responses that we think will work much better at protecting people against Delta variant and other variants that may come. So uh, yes, uh, as you've said well, Mr. Mayor, prior infection is protective, but why wouldn't people want the very best protection from a disease that can kill you? Uh, very safe to get vaccinated if you've had prior infection, definitely the right thing to do. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. Go ahead, Matt. Um, I asked this last week for the number, still haven't gotten it. You guys have been asked about this since March, so I'm looking forward. But regardless, doesn't the city need this information on hand so that you can factor it into your decisions on whether to mandate a vaccine, or is the city simply not accounting for the rates of reinfection among those who've already had COVID? Um, we're counting for everything as best we can. I'll turn to Dr. Varma, but I think, again, it's a factor, but it is not the main event by any stretch of the imagination for all the reasons I think the two doctors just said. We, we are going at a virulent new strain, and vaccination is our best way of stopping it. And the antibody, which, again, people got exposed at different points and different strains right there, that should tell you that uh, vaccination is going to be more effective than relying on previous exposure. We'll put out information. We have been putting out a ton of information, more than I think almost any place in the country. I want transparency. But as it comes to strategy, there's nothing I've heard about reinfection that changes the strategy one iota. Dr. Varma, you want to speak to that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there is this is a complicated topic like everything. And, and again, I'll always emphasize that we're always going to uh, change our recommendations when we see evidence that indicates we need to change. But everything that, that we have seen from the scientific literature and what we see both from the epidemiology in the United States and everywhere else is that the surest path to protecting individuals, protecting our community is through vaccination. And that while being previously infected with the virus does give you protection, that protection is not nearly as strong. It doesn't cover as nearly as many strains as being vaccinated. And we know that vaccination is safe. So the combination of uh, vaccinations on top of uh, a prior virus infection is going to protect people. And, uh, and and we would this is this is something that have been, you know, people will will uh, continue to study and evaluate. But we're going with the best science right now. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Our next question for today goes to Nolan from The Post. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Nolan, how you doing? I'm doing all right, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, several months ago, your police commissioner made the decision to disband the plainclothes units. Um, the Democratic nominee to become the next mayor, Eric Adams says he would bring them back. Uh, do you or your police commissioner regret the decision to disband the units? And what do you make of their likely return? Uh, no, we do not regret. I'll let the commissioner speak for himself, but he and I have spoken about this a number of times. We do not regret it. Uh, it was the right thing to do, remains the right thing to do. I have a lot of respect for Eric Adams. Uh, I very, very energetically endorsed him a few days ago. Um, he has said clearly that if he were to bring it back, he would make some real changes in terms of addressing community concerns. So he has said that there's issues that have to be addressed. But I think what is being missed here, uh, and, and Commissioner Shea and I have been working together for eight years now, um, and I know a lot about his thought pattern, is this was about, of course, trying to bring police and community together, address uh, areas where community felt wronged or disrespected because we need a respectful relationship between police and community to maximize cooperation. But it was also about the larger issue of the goal of the unit was to get guns off the street and then keep them off the street with successful prosecutions. And there was a better way to do that. And I think this stunning number of gun arrests and the increasing number of successful prosecutions now and the gang takedowns proves that the commissioner was right. So that's my introduction. Over to you. Mr. Mayor, we need about two hours on this one, but thanks for the question, Nolan. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, the number of resources we've moved around the department in the last year, which is nothing new, it's ongoing. But I'll give you some examples. We've upstaffed our investigators into the gun violence units, 
Many of those came from the former anti-crime. We've upstaffed the units within each patrol precinct that works on intelligence-led policing, um, that works under the FIO program, which is highly successful in getting guns off the streets. We've also had many of the uh, same officers that were in anti-crime simply put a uniform on and do the exact same job in the same precinct, but making sure we do it the right way. When you look at and step back and look at everything that has transpired, um, I've done that job myself. I think they're some of the best people uh, that this job has to offer. The work that they do day in, day out. I saw it last Saturday night in the Bronx when a lieutenant putting his life on the line, incredible, incredible restraint, trying to protect the people of the Bronx, putting himself at risk, and wound up getting shot for it. The work is going on literally every day across this city by the men and women of this police department to keep New Yorkers safe. They're making more gun arrests than they ever have. They're up 44% in all in this year on top of a 25 year high. Um, and they're doing it the right way. What we need is, and this is the question that many people are not asking enough, we need an appropriate balance in the criminal justice system. You cannot ask the officers to go out and stop, stop, stop people. It will backfire quicker than you know. You need precision, you need intelligence, you need strong prosecutions, and this is what I hear every night across the city when I talk to communities. They know who the bad people are. They know who the gang members are. They want them off the street as much as I want them off the street. So then, then New York City can again move even faster to flourish. We still have some work to do. We still have to get back to where we have zero shootings in a day. Um, we're not satisfied with a 35% drop in July. We know we have a lot more work to do. But the approach we're taking, not a single doubt in my mind that it's the right approach. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Nolan. Yeah, and separately, uh, you've you know, gotten a lot of ink for the city's new vaccine mandate, and it, it's taken some criticism from the usual quarters, but also some criticism from unusual quarters, where the, boss, the, the, the interim mayor of Boston compared it to showing papers and offered several other analogies, including likening it to, uh, you know, birtherism and, and potentially a, a relic of slavery. So uh, the criticism from the right, I guess, is unexpected. But what do you make of this criticism from, from the left? I am hoping and praying she hasn't heard the details uh, and has been uh, improperly briefed because those statements are absolutely inappropriate. Um, this is an idea of how to save lives. This is, this is a way to save lives. This is a way to stop the Delta variant, which is threatening the entire life of this country. The President of the United States endorsed my approach within hours. So I'm assuming the interim mayor has not heard the whole story because I can't believe she would say uh, it's okay to leave so many people unvaccinated and in danger. We tried a purely voluntary approach for seven long months, tons of incentives, lots of tender love and care, lots of communication, lots of respect, lots of dialogue with healthcare professionals. We've done that. It's time for something more muscular at this point to save lives and to stop us from falling backwards. And by the way, you're seeing the private sector embrace this all over the country. So this is a time for people to support this kind of action and help us save lives. The next question goes to Courtney from Fox News. Hi, Mayor. I just wanted to quickly talk to you about the key to NYC. We've heard from a lot of tech people that this might not be super secure. And so I was just wondering what some of the ways are that you're doing to protect people's private information and also how you're going to ensure that people's paper uh, COVID vaccine form is valid and real. Courtney, a very fair question. Well, first of all, it is a criminal offense uh, to alter or create a fraudulent uh, vaccination card. 
um, will get you the specific penalties, but they are substantial. I believe I'm on firm ground. It's up to seven years in prison for uh, falsifying a government instrument. Um, so people should only present a truthful, valid vaccination card. If they don't, they are running a very serious risk and they're doing a disservice to everyone else. In terms of the different approaches, what we've created, uh, the, the COVID Safe app for New York City, is not connected uh, to the internet, can't be hacked. It's just your own personal way of maintaining uh, the information, excuse me, your vaccination card and a valid ID. Obviously, you want those two together. You present a vaccination card, you want to confirm uh, the person who it's connected to. Um, so that's a very simple way uh, to avoid any uh, problems that folks in the tech community might be concerned about. Carrying the card itself is the simplest. A lot of people just have it in their wallet, wherever on them. So we want to continue to pay attention to those concerns, but I think this is one where you know, we have a, a very simple, straightforward approach uh, that's also secure. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, and I'll just do a quick follow up and that'll be my last question. Also sort of for the police commissioner, is there going to be any sort of joint, you know, backing of checking these vaccination cards for people or restaurants enforcing it? How is that going to work? Let me just jump in ahead of the commissioner. This this is a civilian approach. Uh, we again are we're going to be educating uh, businesses uh, over the weeks ahead, working with them. Small business services will be working with them. Health department will be working with them. We want to make it work for everyone. Uh, health department has primary jurisdiction for um, inspections of restaurants. And again, our goal is to handle this on a civilian level, uh, separate from situations that would be exceptional where uh, any kind of law enforcement would be involved. But in terms of day to day, uh, we expect it to be a civilian approach. Go ahead, Commissioner. No, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Go ahead. Next, we have Andrew from NBC New York. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. Uh, Mayor, I know you answered James's question earlier about the, the impact of the Cuomo investigation on city-state relations right now. I'm wondering if you can, you've known the governor such a long time, uh, and you know how his political strategic mind works. What do you think that he thinks his strategy is right now. Hmm. Well, all I can say is I, you know, I, I don't usually quote John Podoritz, but it was, uh, he had a really good point the other day about the level of narcissism in play right now. Um, unfortunately, I think we have a bigger issue here, Andrew, and you've watched for a while too. I, you know, there's that famous phrase, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, this is a guy that got too much power. Um, too many people were afraid of him. Uh, he used his power in a very Machiavellian way. He bullied people. He got his way way too often. He think he could do whatever he wanted. And that was very destructive. It's not good. It's not humanly good. It's not good in a democracy when someone's got too much power. Um, I think he thinks he still may have some sleight of hand here. And he's obviously borrowing a page from the Trump playbook and trying to scorch the earth, attack the people doing the investigation, attack anyone who might prosecute him. It's not going to work. He's out of options. So this is just a matter of time before he's gone. If he was not such a narcissist and he actually could think about other human beings, he would say, hey, you know what? I'm doing a lot of damage at this point. It's time to go. Uh, he, think about those 11 women and what he put them through just out of respect for how he wronged them and trying to atone for his sins. He should step aside right now. But I also think about almost 20 million New Yorkers who are suffering. Just get the hell out of the way. I mean, in the end, maybe he could close off his career with one act of dignity and decency and just step aside. But don't bet on that, Andrew. Go ahead, Andrew. The cancellation of the auto show was purely for COVID concerns and COVID reasons or was canceled in part because Governor Cuomo is so closely associated with the Javits Center and that show itself? Well, that's a great question. I, I don't have a reason other than the broad statement that was made, which is understandable, uh, that with the Delta variant having kicked up so intensely, 
Uh, they were hesitant to have a large indoor gathering um, and that they intend to be back early next year. Um, so I don't have other facts than that. I think you know, you're asking a relevant question, but it's something worth looking at, but I, I will take what they said on face value. Next, we have Yehudit from Borough Park 24. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? I'm doing good, Yehudit. How are you? Good. Thank God. So two weeks ago, I asked you and Chief Harrison um, about exactly what you plan to spend the $200 million you budgeted for the NYPD to upgrade its technological capabilities. And I was told I would hear more information, but unfortunately, I never did. So since Commissioner Shea's on the call, I was wondering whether he can comment on the particular uses of the $200 million and whether now is the time the, for the longtime plan to encrypt and digitize the police radios and furthermore, whether the media will continue to have unfiltered access to the police, re police re related news. Okay, I'm gonna pass that to Commissioner Shea because I am not an expert on the tech elements of the new budget. Uh, and he may not be an uh, expert on every piece of it either, but what can you say to that, Commissioner? Uh, well, what I would say is, number one, we're grateful for the, for the resources to make sure that the best police department in, in the world has the best equipment in the world. So we thank the city council and the mayor for that. Uh, it's, it's very important on the communication side to make sure that the, the um, communications equipment that we have is state of the art. And I think we try to balance it. You brought up the encryption. Uh, question. The encryption is something that I know is very near and dear to the media, and it's very near and dear to me as someone that has conducted investigations, has been on the other end of that equipment, and knows the importance of having, whether it's at a, uh, a large-scale event or as simple as police responding to a burglary in progress and knowing that the criminals don't know that they're about to get on the scene. Um, we're going to tackle these issues. We're, we're going to do it transparently, as we have in the past in terms of being forthcoming with what we're considering doing. Uh, but these are still things that are being debated right now. But encryption, I, I think, is something that absolutely has to be looked at uh, in law enforcement, and it's, it's vital to the integrity of investigations. Thank you. Go ahead, Yehuda. And then also on a different topic, thank you for that. Last week in Borough Park, a young child who was right, waiting for a bus was unfortunately sent to the hospital after sadly being struck by someone riding a scooter. A few weeks ago, Senator, State Senator Liz Kruger introduced a new bill that said that the drivers of e-scooters, e-bikes, and maybe dirt bikes that the NB, NYPD are getting rid of um, who harm pedestrians should be actually charged with not misdemeanors but felonies, and which drivers of cars who commit hit and runs are. I was wondering whether the mayor supports that new legislation that drivers of e-scooters and e-bikes should be more accountable and receive the same harsher penalties that drivers of cars do for a hit-and-run accident. Yehuda, thank you for the question. I, I will state, obviously, I have not seen the uh, legislation, so I won't go into detail about that. I'll speak broadly. I am a uh, radical on this issue. I think anybody who harms another person with a car, a motorcycle, uh, an e-bike, a scooter, anything, should suffer tougher penalties. I think there's a problem with our legal structure. I have felt this for years. I've said it for years. I've fought for tougher penalties. It is essential division zero. And I think people should be honest. Uh, don't want to hear from different interests or different companies saying, well, we shouldn't get tough penalties, but you know, put it on the car or the truck or whatever. Everyone should have it. If you hurt someone with any vehicle, you hurt someone. And there needs to be accountability and not a sense of recklessness. We, we are a big, complicated city, and there's not enough space. And what it says is everyone has to be accountable and respectful of each other and slow down and not just think about yourself. So you hood it broadly, I want to see tougher penalties for a variety of vehicles. On that legislation, we'll take a look at that and, and come back to you on the specifics. We have time for two more for today. Next, we have Chris from the Daily News. Hi, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for taking my question. How you doing, Chris? I'm good, thanks for asking. Uh, on the indoor vaccine mandates, uh, I was wondering how is enforcement going to work if a restaurant or bar is found to have unvaccinated customers present? Will the restaurant be fined or the customer or both? And also how big do you think these fines are going to be? Chris, fair questions, and that's what over the next few weeks 
We're going to be outlining all the, the kind of rules and regulations around this. It's a new thing. We want to talk to stakeholders, get their input as we formulate it. And as we've also said, there'll be about a month where people, where it will be in effect, but we're going to be working, educating people before the, the focused enforcement uh, and penalties ever occur. But, but Chris, a good analogy is, you know, restaurants and bars are responsible for carting anyone who might be underage uh, for drinking. And a lot of them, you know, rightfully uh, do a broad approach to that to make sure they don't miss anyone. Uh, this, is, this is something, as an example, I mean, obviously restaurants and bars are responsible for health and safety standards. They know they have an obligation to the public, and they know it's first and foremost around health and following the law. So this will not be uncharted territory for them, but we're going to work with them to get it right, and we'll be very clear about what penalties are. But, you know, I do not expect a lot of penalties. I expect the vast majority of establishments to want to do this the right way and follow through. That's what we saw throughout this whole crisis. Vast majority of indoor establishments have been very loyal about following the rules to protect people. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you. And uh, another question for Commissioner Shea. Um, the other day, video posted to social media showed uh, an NYPD sergeant grabbing a woman's leg and tackling her to the ground after she had apparently jumped a turnstile in Manhattan and um, tried to resist arrest after that. Uh, after that, Commissioner, you said you did not condone what happened in that video. So I'm wondering, how do you think NYPD officers should better deal with situations like that where low level of low level offenders are resisting arrest? Well, I, well, I think what I said the other day was that it was under investigation and we'll wait for the investigation. And then I went very detailed into the fact that I had watched about 40 minutes of video detailing exactly what transpired. I can recount it, but I'll do it quick. Um, enforcement at uh, a lower Manhattan station where you saw individuals jumping the turnstile, probably too many, quite frankly. Many people, most people were paying the fare, but too many weren't. And people were being pulled aside and issued tickets, asked for ID, and let go in short order. And that was kind of business as usual happening. There were two instances that I saw, one being the one you mentioned, where the individual, a, a, a young lady, uh, refused to give ID, started cursing and berating the officer, and eventually that led to what you referred to. I think the message here is comply. Comply, uh, and, and there won't be a problem, quite frankly. Um, the investigation is under review to make sure that anything uh, that did occur was appropriate, and if not, then th there would be discipline. But you, no one should draw any conclusions until that investigation is over. Thank you. Go ahead. Our last question for today goes to Erin from Politico. Mr. Mayor, um, so you reported this increase in uh, vaccine numbers that you see. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, at the same time, you still have cases uh, going up, and obviously these are just first doses and they just happened. But do you have a sense of, like, is there a threshold point, uh, you know, that you kind of need to get to, like where you, we can get to with vaccines that will actually stop this and, 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 you know, reverse it back to where we were a few weeks and months ago when everything looked a lot better? It's a great question, Aaron. I want to tell you, first of all, again, we see very clear evidence already that the mandates are working, that the $100 incentive is working. Also, in terms of the specific mandate for city workers, important fact, uh, last week, uh, compared to the previous week, we've seen a 189% increase among health and hospital workers getting vaccinations. Uh, so, you know, we, we told people this was coming. People immediately started getting vaccination. It's making an impact with our workforce. We expect a lot more of that. But Aaron, look, the reason that we are focused on vaccination incessantly is that there isn't a, a narrow, easy endpoint to get to. It is not that we can say, you know, hey, you get to this exact number and you're done. It's something we're going to keep at, and we want to drive that number as high as humanly possible. We've passed the 5 million mark, which is great. We've got now over 5 million New Yorkers who have received at least one dose, 4.6 4 million fully vaccinated. Uh, 
So that's over 60% of the entire population of the city has gotten at least one dose. Over 72% of adults have gotten at least one dose. 250,000 kids in the 12 to 17 range have gotten at least one dose. We really are at very high numbers uh, in comparison to most of the country. But we gotta go further. So to me, this just, it just doesn't end until we defeat COVID and we keep building vaccination. That's the whole ball game. We're gonna watch, and I'll turn to Dr. Varma, he can elaborate a little bit, or, and, and if Dr. Katz wants to add on this. Three things, Aaron, vaccination levels, hospitalization rate, and cases. Right now, vaccination levels, very strong, we need to make them stronger. Hospitalization rate still well within the levels that we need to be, and hospitals are handling cases well and getting much better outcomes. Cases higher than we want for sure. But when you composite all that, New York City is still moving forward, still recovering. We got to keep it that way. Dr. Varma and Dr. Katz, you want to add? Great. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the question. And this is just another opportunity for us to emphasize that you know, we have to always be humble in the face of this virus. Uh, it continues to uh, uh, evolve and challenge us in ways that we can't always know for sure. Uh, we, I think really the, the, the essence of what your question is, is there a level of vaccination in which we can say that we don't have to worry about COVID anymore, we're all done? And th the answer, of course, is that, of course, if we had 100% of the population vaccinated, uh, we can say with pretty high certainty that that would end this epidemic and, and COVID would be in the back uh, door for a while, you know, for, for a long time. The real challenge is, okay, what level below 100% is what you need? And, and that's what people often refer to as a herd immunity or a community immunity threshold. And the reality is we don't know the exact number for that right now. And so the best approach that we can take is the one that the mayor has basically said. We need to get everybody who is eligible to be vaccinated to be vaccinated, and that if people choose not to be vaccinated, we need to make indoor spaces as safe as possible. And the best way to do that is to uh, restrict those to people who have been vaccinated. So we know that vaccines are highly effective. We know that there is some level of vaccination in the population uh, that's gonna really kind of end COVID for us. Uh, but we don't really have an exact number for that at this time. Thank you. Dr. Katz, you want to add? I just want to add again that I think in the future, our whole focus will be on who is sick with COVID uh, and not so much cases, but who is sick. And when you look across the country, 98% of the people who are in the hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. And so if all of those people had been vaccinated, they wouldn't be in the hospital. Um, and we would be able to return to a world where, yes, there might be some transmission of COVID, but nobody would get sick. Um, and so that's why, sir, you're so right that the ball game is vaccination. Thank you. Amen. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, thanks. And then, I mean, secondly, I wanted to ask about the uh, racial disparities in the vaccine rates. Um, you know, early on when they were first reported, um, you know, uh, Black and Latino New Yorkers collectively had lower rates, um, you know, which could be attributed to a number of access and socioeconomic issues. Currently, it looks like Latino and white New Yorkers are pretty much on par, and Black New Yorkers in particular have the lowest um, vaccine rate. Just wondering, you know, if you have a sense of why that is and, and what is being done specifically to address that. Um, you know, I think you're right to, first of all, a very important issue. Second of all, you're right to say a variety of factors at play. Um, folks have been through hell uh, in all communities, and we know the Black community was hit very, very hard by COVID. There's a lot of pain, there's a lot of distrust, there's a lot of historical distrust, there's a lot of misinformation out there in all communities. Um, but what we do see, you, you made a really important point, we've seen consistent progress. We've seen the numbers come up consistently in the black community. We've seen a Latino community where it used to be a very big gap, that gap has greatly reduced. Clearly, we're now at the numbers of vaccinations that say the whole city has bought into vaccination. I mean, you saw those numbers. Again, these are pure, 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 pure majorities if ever I saw them. 72% of adults 
have already gotten vaccinated, at least one dose, and more coming in now. We see the numbers going up. Again, over 60% of all New Yorkers have had at least one dose. Those are super majorities. But to reach more deeply, I think it's a combination of continued education, uh, continued outreach, continued work with community organizations and leaders. I think the $100 incentive will work. And I absolutely believe that the mandates, the public service mandate for our public service workers, the indoor dining entertainment mandate, are going to very deeply improve numbers in communities of color. Because a lot of those folks are folks who work for the city or work in those industries. A lot of those folks will be very interested in the incentive and the combination works together. So I think this is going to be another way we turn that and, and reduce that disparity. Let's see if Dr. Varma or Dr. Katz have anything to add. I would add, sir, just as I, I take care of a large number of African-American patients in my practice. Um, and so I know it isn't anymore an issue of access. It may have once been an issue of access, but now for each one, I can send them right downstairs where they see me um, and get the vaccine at that moment without waiting and, and uh, your incentives help as well. Uh, but systemic racism is a complicated issue and it includes things like access. But it also includes things like prior experience with the uh, health care, prior experience with the government. And there remains, because of our history in this country of uh, racism, there remains a lot of fear in the African-American community about the vaccine. And I think that your administration and its work with the uh, reverends and, and the leaders in the African-American community and uh, Positions is all of the right thing and that over time we are convincing people that they are safer with vaccination and that that will happen more and more. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Varma. Want to add? Uh, nothing for me. Thank you. Okay, everyone, as we conclude today, uh, again, so many challenges, but so much good news too. And these vaccination numbers I just went over, those super majorities of New Yorkers who are buying into vaccination, the reason that we're having the really powerful recovery we're having. We need to get more and more people to make us all safe, and we're going to continue to do that work every single day. Just want to give you a, a programming note, as it were. Uh, I'm going to do what so many New Yorkers are doing right now and finally go see family uh, that I've been missing deeply for the last year and a half and haven't seen since the beginning of this pandemic. So. We're not going to be having our normal uh, press briefings next week. We'll all take a week off. Uh, I'm really looking forward to reconnecting with people. A year and a half is a long time. I know everyone is feeling the same thing about family, loved ones you've missed. Uh, but then we will resume as normal uh, the week after that. And we will keep fighting every day to bring this city back. Thank you, everybody.